very pleased to receive Bob Last, Senior Advisor on Human Rights at the UK Mission here in Geneva. He's been around for quite a while, so he has an extensive knowledge of how the Human Rights Council and the UPR uh, work. And he's going to be providing some insight about um, how the UK drafts the statements at the UPR. So Bob, thank you very much for accepting this, uh, this interview. We're really looking forward to hearing more about how the UK participates in the UPR, they're one of the most active states. Uh, we've seen through the first cycle. So um, maybe you can tell us how long you've been in Geneva very quickly and, uh, and how, what you've been following since, since you've been here and then we'll go more into the, to the questions. Sure. Uh, I've been in Geneva for around 10 years now covering mainly the Human Rights Council and for a little while before that the Commission on Human Rights but mainly following developments on human rights at the UN. And you, Bob has a, has a blog that it gives some very good insights about the, the work of the, of the council and the, and the UPI and has some um, uh, corridor stories about the, 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 this world, so this is very interesting too and we encourage you to, to have a look at it. So, Bob, what's I think interesting for NGOs is to know how uh, the UK is preparing the statements, what's the dynamic between uh, the capital, London, the embassies in the country and Geneva and how do you go about this and what are the delays to prepare the, the statements, how long does it take and so on for preparing the statements in the yes. UPR. Um, it's a, a combined effort really between our post services, our geographic desks in London and then with a little bit of input from Geneva mainly in terms of, of uh, tone and, and a little bit on, on content. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really a, a joint effort and in terms of who takes the lead it depends a little bit where the expertise lies. So if we have a post that works quite a lot on human rights They'll probably have a bit more input than a post where they cover human rights um, relatively less. Mm -hmm. um, but in all cases, it's, it's a joint effort. And how long did, does it take? The process starts a few months before the, the review, mm -hmm. mostly from the embassy, or as you said, it really depends on the, of the specificities? Or... Yeah, the way it works is that we have a human rights department in London and within that department there's a, a team which covers UN human rights issues mm -hmm. and one of the people in that team has the overall responsibility for coordinating the UK's approach to okay. UPR and what they will do is in advance of the UPR session coming up it is send a message round to all the posts overseas and their geographic desks in London that UPR is on its way and that there will be a number of documents coming up that will serve as the basis for that review mm -hmm. and then as we get closer they'll set some deadlines for submitting advanced questions and submitting uh, a national statement. And how do, you, um, how do you look into the recommendations that the UK made during the first cycle? How do you follow up with that? Do you, does London send the, the recommendations that you made to the embassies or I mean, how do you ensure that you're following up with the recommendations that you made at the, at the first cycle? How does well, it work? Well, that's one of the things that we'll take into consideration when we're preparing our, our statements and our advanced questions for the next round. Mm -hmm. So, um, for the last round of UPR, one of the things which we asked about in our advanced questions was what the, the country under review had done to implement the recommendations from the first round and focus that a bit on, on UK recommendations. Um, in terms of how we measure that, we use the national report and, and the two other reports, so one from the Office of the High Commissioner of yes. Human Rights and one from NGOs. Um, but it's, it varies a bit on the type of recommendation that we made. So where we have recommended a ratification of a treaty, it's, it's quite easy to measure, exactly. Yes. Um, and it also depends a bit on how specific the recommendation was. If it's a, a more loosely worded recommendation, it is a little bit harder to assess sometimes. Yes, yes, yes. And meeting with NGOs, does that help you? Do you also meet NGOs in Geneva? Yeah, we're quite open to meeting NGOs both in our post overseas and in Geneva. Um, we did that throughout the first round of UPR and we carried it on in the yeah. second round. And that is also a, a very good source of information. Reading a document is one thing, but discussing and people people yes. meeting people is, is another. So yeah. that, that is very helpful for sure. And the UK has uh, made uh, this pledge in last March with uh, 38 other states to only make two recommendations to each state on the review yeah. at the second cycle. So we've, we've seen that has been followed to a great, to a great extent by, by states um, at this 13th session last May. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you, um, first maybe can you explain uh, briefly why you, you made that decision? Yeah, as we were getting towards the end of the first round we saw that there were a, a huge number of recommendations mm -hmm. coming in and the, the average had gone up from sort of 
20 or 30 in the very first session to around 200 in, in the final session, sort of four years later. And we were concerned that the situation was becoming unmanageable and that we would end up having so many recommendations that states wouldn't really know where to start mm -hmm. when they began to decide which ones to implement. So it was an attempt to bring in a, a sense of rationality into, into the system. Um, and we think it's been relatively successful already yes. in that the, the number has stayed more or less manageable from, mm. from the first round of the second cycle. Yeah, there's about the same number of recommendations, even though there's more states speaking. So that means states recommending states have slightly reduced the number of recommendations they made. So that's a, that's, a good, uh, that's a good initiative. And there's a concern among NGOs that states will then have to choose the issues they're going to have to raise because if they move from five recommendations to two, mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the, the concern is that the states will then uh, go into easy issues rather than raising difficult um, questions because they only have two recommendations. They, can, they will tend to go to more easy issues to raise and not look into the specific points. So what, what's your view on that? How do you make sure that you can raise the recommendations from 2008, raise new developments mm -hmm. and still look into very specific uh, issues that's going to be difficult to manage. It is a bit of a challenge working out which issues to raise and it will require some discipline but in terms of the particular concern which you've addressed I don't think that's been the case so far I think for the reviews that have already taken place mm -hmm. in the second round we've seen a very broad range of issues yes. raised including in the UK's own mm -hmm. UPR. Um, I think we've seen perhaps a little bit less repetition so mm -hmm. which is Good. Delegations, I think, have probably worked out what other delegations tend to raise as issues mm -hmm. and, and maybe have avoided repeating where it hasn't been one of their priorities. Yeah. Um, but overall, uh, I think it's it, the, the benefits of doing that are vastly outweigh the, mm -hmm. the potential risks which you, you've talked about. And the, the decisions to choose the issues, again, are amongst the capital, the embassy, and Geneva, how to choose the priorities to raise. Yeah, in, in terms of the priorities which each country raises, that's for that individual country. Mm -hmm. and, and for the UK, the way in which we approach that is to look first at our human rights priorities. So okay. we have five thematic human rights priorities which are on, on freedom of religion, freedom of expression, women's rights, uh, prevention of torture, and the death penalty. Okay. Um, so we will think first whether those particular priorities ought to be reflected. Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, think what particular issues might be relevant to that country. Great. So I think this is very helpful to know better how states work and for NGOs to find uh, to, to to find better ways to influence uh, statements. And we've seen that mm -hmm. uh, doing it in advance in Geneva, but also in the country, is, is quite an effective way to to influence the process. So thank you very much for very for this interview, and we'll be uh, looking forward to. Uh, UK's contribution to the second cycle. Thanks a lot.